Hey, coming up, we have stories about Taylor Swift obsessions, husband pretending to have a different family, follower requested sister-in-law being served on a kitty plate. We have a cake story that ends a marriage, cheating spouses who out themselves, two times petty revenge, and... I think that's it. So stay tuned and strap yourselves in because this is going to be a wild ride. I know specifically there's one story that we're going to have to buckle up for. It'll be a popcorn popping story. Hey there, it's Dusty Thunder with another story for you. This one is titled, Am I the Ask Not Because I Don't Emotionally Support My Wife's Obsession with Taylor Swift? I did not write this. Disclaimer. My wife is fully obsessed with Taylor Swift. For the last year plus, that's all she listens to. Every Taylor Swift album on one continuous loop when she's working out or even just walking around the house doing stuff. Spent 2K to go see her recently at the Eras Tour. Probably spent another 200 on merch. That's cute. I'm guessing it was way more than that. She filmed the show on her phone and will regularly put it on the TV and just watch for hours. So she's definitely going to see the movie that's coming out. We'll also watch the live streams of her performances on TikTok or whatever streaming platform those are on. Is now going to see the concert movie. I mean, it has been nonstop Taylor Swift in our house for a long time now. She continually refers to the live concert as the best experience of my life. She says Taylor Swift is a lifestyle. I personally don't really get it. I have never been obsessed with anything to that point. I love soccer and would love to go watch Messi play, but I can't bring myself to spend $900 for a ticket to his upcoming match. It's just too much. Is that how much soccer tickets are? Wow. I'm also really passionate about things that my wife has no interest in, but I'm also not looking for her emotional support with those. Those are just things that are important to me and will remain important to me regardless. I have for sure made comments to my wife implying that this whole Taylor Swift thing is getting out of hand. I was also not so super stoked that she was spending that much on one ticket to go see one concert, but ultimately it's what she really wanted and we had the money so I said yes, and I'm happy that she got to go. Recently she blew up on me about how I don't support her as much as she thinks I should with her Taylor Swift lifestyle. She cites comments I make implying it's a cult and the only one winning here is Taylor Swift raking in the dough and maybe it's time to focus on other things. She wants me to stop making comments like that and stop rolling my eyes and be supportive of her and her interests, but from my perspective it's really taking over her life and that just can't be healthy to obsess over something like that. People need balance. I also thought one of the benefits of marriage was to have someone tell you this kind of stuff and it shouldn't be an argument. Where'd you get that idea? I never heard that. So, am I the astronaut? If so, what can I do about this situation to make things right? Oh, dear Lord. I imagine there are a lot of people in this position. I've never seen anything like it. Let me start there. I have never seen anything like the level of fandom that Taylor Swift has been able to initiate or activate or unlock in people. It is amazing. It is unlike anything I think we'll see in our lifetime again. I think this is beyond Michael Jackson. This is beyond the Beatles. This is truly incredible how she's been able to build this fan base and be such an incredible artist but brilliant business person at the same time. Everything has meaning behind it. Everything is super well thought out. As you start looking at things and dissecting them or hearing people talk about them, it's just wild how well everything is thought out. So I went to the Reputation Tour with Candy Thunder and the girls. I did not go to the the Eras Tour. I was the driver up there, Tony Spark went in my place. I think you you might have heard that story. So I know that there's a lot of love for Taylor Swift in our group of people. I have a ton of respect for her. In this situation, putting myself in OP's shoes here, the first thought that I have is reverse the roles. And if OP was, I'm not going to say obsessed because I think obsessed casts a negative light over this. If OP was a super fan of something, if his wife was shitting on that thing, whatever it was actively, he wouldn't appreciate that. It would be looked at from his perspective as, well, she doesn't respect me enough to take the time to understand and respect the thing that I really, really care about here. Now, I agree that you can't let something run your life, right? You can't just focus on this thing 24-7. If this was a true obsession that was to the detriment of everything else in her life, like she was shirking giving time to her relationship, shirking duties at work and home, and like if it was ruining her life, that would be one thing, and I would say that's an obsession. If she's just a super fan and she just loves all things 
Taylor Swift. She's one of the millions of people in the world who are just like that. And I think you have to accept that it's something that you're not going to fully understand, but you don't have to. You don't have to be a super fan of the same things that your spouse is a super fan of. I think you do have to respect it. And I think him rolling his eyes and making comments that it's a cult and doing these things, taking these little jabs comes across to her as a disrespectful thing because she probably feels like he's not taking the time to try to understand it or at least respect it. He doesn't have to like it. He doesn't have to love it. He doesn't have to share in this, but it's the digs. It's the digs and the eye rolls and making the sly comments that I think that's the part that is the problem here. And and it bugs her. Obviously it bugs her. It would bug any super fan. Take Taylor Swift out of the equation here. It's anything. Say that she got into LARPing, right? Say that she got into table games. Say that she got into playing freaking Call of Duty. Whatever it is, if that became her thing, you would want your spouse to support something that you really care about. You would. Candy Thunder and I, for instance, let's say that I got more serious about learning piano, which I do casually right now. I'm casually learning piano. If I got really serious about it and wanted to make a real run at it and started devoting more time to it and started talking about it more and becoming more of a super fan of that kind of thing, she's not going to get it. She doesn't have to get it, but she wouldn't shit on it. She wouldn't start making comments that made me feel like I was wasting my time and that she looked down on me. It is this. It is the I'm looking down on you perspective where he's screwing up here. And I think that is the problem here. It doesn't matter what he thinks about it. As long as it's not running her life into the ground, as long as she's not neglecting other things in her life, what harm is this doing, dude? You don't understand it, and that's fine. You don't have to. But if it's not causing harm, the least you can do is respect her enough to let her enjoy your thing. It could be anything. Let's say OP here really gets into comic books or something. She's not going to understand that either, but she's probably not going to roll her eyes or make comments about it that make him feel belittled. Belittling your partner to the point where they bring it up and say, hey, why are you always shitting on this? I don't feel good about that. That's a problem. This comment really got me. I also thought that one of the benefits of marriage was to have someone tell you this kind of stuff and it shouldn't be an argument. You must have received a different brochure than I did, sir. That's not in the marketing literature for marriage at all. Now, having someone as a partner that will speak up and tell you things that you aren't seeing, yes, that is one of the supposed benefits here to have someone say, hey, you're probably not seeing this, but here's what I'm seeing. But there's a healthy way to do that and there's a respectful way to do that and it's not rolling your eyes and making comments about it being a cult. It is if it got to a point where it was causing a detriment in life saying, hey, you're probably not seeing this because you're too close to it and you're knee deep in it, but here's what I'm seeing. That's what you're talking about here. But this whole, it shouldn't be an argument thing. Ha ha, ha ha, ha ha ha. No, there nowhere is this written that you can say whatever you want and it shouldn't be an argument. If anything, it's the reverse. It's say things that shouldn't cause arguments and it probably will because that's marriage and moods are dependent there. And it's just, that's just the way it is, man. So I don't know. My general take right now is yeah, OP is the asshole right now for having this stance that they're allowed to do this and she shouldn't be taking offense. He's judging something that she cares about. That's the bottom line. Not taking the time to try to understand it or even just at a baseline respect it. He's just shitting on it. And yes, that is an asshole move. My stance on this is, so whenever I went through getting the tickets for the Eras Tour, it was a panic moment because they were disappearing left and right, right? So I got better ones than I probably normally would have got because they were disappearing and felt sick for a week about the amount of money that I had just spent on tickets. I was like, oh my God. But... Knowing that there was a a really good possibility that I wouldn't even be going to this, it didn't matter. It was worth it to be able to give my wife and my daughters this experience. This experience is hard to put a price tag on because it is a once in a lifetime thing for them unless they go to multiple ones. And that's why the movie thing is going to go so well. That's why it's so successful. And it's why she's able to do the things that she does because she creates an experience and that's hard to put a price tag on. But yeah, he's probably looking at the money of this. That's certainly an element to it. Also, he's probably a little bit butthurt because Taylor Swift is getting more attention than he is right now. He may not even realize that's part of the issue here. He may not even be self-aware enough to be able to say, yeah, you know what? I am. I am a little jealous of this. It's like they got a new puppy and the puppy gets all the attention. And that, if he does come to the conclusion that that's where he's at, that is a detriment to the relationship that he's got to speak up about, but he would have to communicate that. He's got to be able to communicate his feelings and talk about how and why this is really bugging him. Otherwise, he doesn't have shit to say. 
Let's go ahead and uh, and see where we need to be on the scale here. Ask on four is could have done that differently. Three is you should have done that differently. Two is you definitely shouldn't have done that. And one is you're a terrible human being. I don't think he's a terrible human being for this. But the question is, am I the asking on because I don't emotionally support my wife's obsession with Taylor Swift? I think even just the way that this is written is a I'm shitting on your interests kind of thing. And I definitely don't think he should be doing this, at least the way that he's doing it. So it's kind of a, a three, two, because it's you should have done it differently, but is that definitely shouldn't be doing this, the specific lane of thing. There we go. We're going to take a little trip all the way up to ask on two. You don't have to understand it, dude. Just don't shit on it. What goes around comes around. And eventually you're going to find something that you really enjoy too. And if that starts getting shit on, you're not going to be happy about that. Hey there, it's Dusty Thunder again with another story for you. This one is titled, I'm leaving my husband because he's living another life online where my sister and her children are his family. With an update. Oh boy. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start this one off with this. Red alert mode back here already. Hi again, I'm sorry. I think I just deleted my account yesterday, thinking it was only deactivated. Anyway, I wrote about my husband being upset about my sister gaining weight. I received a lot of comments and DMs making me understand that my feelings of yuck were valid. It is weird that he cares. I stayed up until the wee hours going through his computer and phone. My husband is a gamer and we have a gaming room. He hasn't changed his passwords and codes since we were dating and while he was sleeping, I was up snooping. Anyway, I was shocked with what I saw. Yes, my husband is in love or at least has a crush on my sister. Boop. I'm not the only one he's complaining to about her weight gain. His best friend knows everything everything. He actually sends him pictures of my sister and openly admits that he uses these pictures to pleasure himself some nights. Okay. He complains that she's getting fatter. He's annoyed that she might be pregnant or that she's just going to ruin her beauty. He's also taken pictures of her on our vacations in a bikini, maybe hundreds. Some of them he has just cropped me out of. <laughs> he cropped her out of the pictures. He cropped her out. That's a new level of what in the hell are you doing, bro? On his PC, he has group chats with his gaming friends, people that don't know him in real life. To those, he pretends that my sister and her children are his family. He proudly brags about having her. His profile picture is of her, her children, and him from a Christmas party. I'm shocked and disturbed and very confused. I never pressure him to do anything nice to me, but he tells me he loves me every day. He kisses and hugs me all the time. He never complains about me or my appearance, and although he never compliments my looks, he never complains about them either. My sister is very beautiful, and she has always been beautiful. I've learned that I could be other things, and I'm fine with it. I have many great qualities and I always get compliments for them. That's why I never reacted to the lack of compliments from my husband. That's just how things have always been for me. I don't know if he loves me. Not two weeks ago, we had our 10th anniversary and he surprised me with a weekend in Paris and a beautiful new engraved wedding band. What's going on? And what about posing her children as his? My husband and I are child free and it was his choice. He never wanted children. Ever. I didn't appreciate some of you trying to make my sister involved in this. She's not. She's an amazing sister, and she would never do that to me. To make it even clearer, after sweeping all of his devices, there's nothing from her to him that could remotely be interpreted as suspicious. They don't talk in private, and the last text he has from her is when I turned 30 and they were planning a surprise party. Other than that, they communicate through our group chats, so please stop. About our weight, none of us is obese. I've always been on the Kirby side. My sister is very slim. She has been fighting depression almost all of her adult life because of something that happened to her in the past. And when she's depressed, she can't eat. So when she gains weight, we're all delighted because it means she's happy and eating well. I'm divorcing my husband. I have yet to tell him what I've read and seen. I'm not ashamed that I have snooped around his private matters and I'm not going to wait and listen to excuses. This is beyond creepy and beyond salvation. It is so over. Update. Now I've told my mom and I've talked to my soon-to-be ex-husband. I told him everything as a first step. She is as baffled as I am and she also doesn't know what to do about my sister given her past. She was essayed in college, changed her as a person forever. I mentioned it to her. 
about maybe asking her therapist for help. Thank you to the Redditor who suggested that. She's going to contact her therapist tomorrow. Besides me, mom and dad, my sister's therapist, nobody knows about her being essayed. She wants to keep it a secret from her husband. After we've talked to her, she could decide telling brother-in-law or not. He's a good man and I'm sure he's going to be a great support should she decide to tell him. And then I will hopefully get her forgiveness. I'm so sorry to have introduced such a horrid man to her life. My soon-to-be ex-husband called when he saw that I've been on his phone and PC. He asked me where I was and when I will be coming home. I told him, come on, you know I'm not coming back. He sounded so defeated. Told me he was disgusted with himself and that he was sorry and that he loved me. He just wasn't in love with me and hasn't been for two years. I told him that I never wanted to see him again and most importantly, I never want him to contact my sister. He said he would never do that and that he never would have acted on his fantasies. It's just his escape from reality. He hasn't been feeling well and this was his go-to comfort. He's posing as a richer man, more successful with a beautiful wife and beautiful children and his friends admire him for it. And it gives him the rush he needs to cope with reality. Anyway, he begged me not to tell my sister and especially not her husband and promised to never bother me again. I don't know what to feel. I'm numb. Maybe the hurt and sadness will come later. I'm more repulsed and disappointed right now. Only last weekend we were planning new renovations and a new car. My mom is awesome. She told me not to rush the heartbreak because it will be coming eventually. I'm on survival mode right now. Tears will come when everything settles and divorce is a fact, not just a reaction. Thank you all for the support. Life goes on. If his way of coping is to have a fake life that he pretends that is his, his real life is never going to be good enough. That's not a coping mechanism. That is fantasy. I think the dangerous part about fantasies like this is that if that's his comfort thing, if that's what he goes to, and if that makes him feel good and that's his escape, then he's always going to need an escape because reality will never be good enough. It doesn't matter who he's with. He's always going to spool up this new fantasy because he knew that it made him feel good before. This is going to be a repeated cycle for him for the rest of his life. It's going to be this over and over and over again, and he's never going to be satisfied with reality ever. That's the dangerous part. And if you're never satisfied with reality, having a healthy relationship is just impossible. The weird part for me is that he acted happy to her, right? Acted. He did all the things. He told her he loved her all the time, took her on an anniversary trip to Paris, did all of these things or was planning it at least. Like he was checking the boxes to make sure that she thought he was happy so that he could keep his fantasy going on the side. That's the confusing part there. He needs her there, but he also needs the fantasy on the side. So the question now is, now that he's lost her, is he going to feel that deficit or is the fantasy the only thing that matters? To me, it seems like he was trying to water, at least maintain reality to keep it as a stasis, as a benchmark, but then would also have the fantasy going on. So now he doesn't have the quality of reality that he had before. How does that change the fantasy? And he's way too comfortable with it. That's his preferred spot. His preferred family is his fake family. His preferred wife is his fake wife. His preferred reality is the virtual one. He says he would never act on it, and I kind of buy it. I kind of buy that he would never act on it because he needs it to be a fantasy. Otherwise, let's say if he ended up with the sister, he would have to spool up a new fantasy about someone else because that's his escape. He's always going to need it. So uh, he gets one of these. He's got some issues. Definitely has some issues to work through. He needs therapy for him. Relationship is gone. It's done. It's over. No mas. But... He's got to break this cycle of needing that escape, needing that fantasy in order to live day to day. If that's how he fills up his cup, then he's going to have to find some other way to do it. He needs individual therapy time. But yes, right now, for being willing to do this to his partner, ask on one. Ask on one, brozo. This is messed up. Wow. And OP's right. The pain and the feelings will come later. She's shell-shocked. She's in trauma right now. And she's just in shock. So after the shock wears off, yes, this will all affect her. But I saw some comments in here that confirm what I'm thinking here about OP and poor OP here now forever. Not just with him because this relationship is over, but moving forward is always going to wonder if the person that she's with has a fantasy family or fantasy wife that is better than her. That's going to be a hard thing to move past. Hey there, it's Dusty Thunder again with another Reddit story for you. This one is actually from Traumatize Them Back. 
which is new for me. And it is titled, Am I the Astronaut for Serving My 30 Female Sister-in-Law, 32 Female Dinner on a Kid's Plate? It's supposed to be a fun one. My husband and I have family dinners at our house every month or so with our family. We have some sets of fine china that I like to switch out between the seasons that I've inherited from my grandmother. When we have our get-togethers, I serve dinner on these plates. My mother-in-law compliments them every time. My sister-in-law, however, has made comments to me that these aren't my style. I honestly didn't think twice about her comment until this past February when one of my plates was put in the sink, broken, chalked it up to an accident. Oh no, the fact that it was mentioned here means that it wasn't an accident. So this plate isn't my style, I'm going to break it. That's where we're at so far. Got it? Check. In April, we had another dinner. This time, sister-in-law was carrying both her and her boyfriend's plates to the sink and accidentally dropped them both. Oopsie. Again, no biggie at all. In May, she broke two more plates, and in June, she broke a plate and a cup. Okay. She's a dropper. Don't throw her the ball. She's a dropper. Again, no biggie at all. <laughs> OP is like, yeah, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. In May, she broke two more plates, and in June, she broke a plate and a cup. At this point, I was catching on. I brought up these concerns to my husband, and he brushed it off as accidents. Wait, it's accidents. I told my mom and she said she thought my sister-in-law was doing it on purpose and got me a camera to put in my dining room. Hell yeah, mom. Mom's like, you know what? I think there's more to this story. I think we need to investigate. I think we need to get a gosh heckin' camera and test this theory. I like mom's style here. She's not just making an accusation. She's not jumping to conclusions. She's like, let's gather evidence. In July, we had dinner. And I had an opportunity arise. My mother-in-law, sister-in-law, and her boyfriend joined us for dinner. While our plates were still on the table, my mother-in-law asked how my plants were doing, and I said I'd show her. I told my husband to follow us outside so he could show her the plant he's growing, leaving sister-in-law alone with her boyfriend. When we came back inside five minutes later, her plate was broken. I don't know how this happened. It's like plates don't like me. They look at me and they just shut her with fear. When they left, I pulled the camera footage. I saw her stand up when we walked out and peek around the corner and then throw the plate on the ground. That brings me to this past weekend. We had our family dinner and we were joined by my in-laws, sister-in-law, and her boyfriend, as well as my parents, siblings, and niece. Time out. Wouldn't the boyfriend at this point be like, what is happening? Why do you break plates everywhere you go? And why do we keep coming back here? Why do they keep letting you come back here? What, how's the boyfriend at this point not like, yo, uh, I'm really concerned. Why are you always breaking stuff and acting this crazy? And I don't, I don't know what to do with this information. But the fact that she keeps coming back and the fact that he keeps coming back with her, I'm like, Pff. My brain is shattered like a piece of fine china. That brings me to this past weekend. We had our family dinner and we were joined by my in-laws, sister-in-law and her boyfriend, as well as my parents, siblings and niece. I served everyone, saving evil sister-in-law for last. I brought her food out on a child's plate with a sippy cup and got those kids silverware with the plastic handles. Yes. So good. So good. She looked at me confused and said, I think you've mixed up my plate with your niece's plate. And I said, no, no. Niece's name is uh, responsible enough to eat on a grown-up's plate. If you're going to act like a child in my home, I'm going to treat you like a child in my home. She tried to play coy, but I had my iPad ready and played the video to everyone at the table. She started sobbing, swiped the kid's plate off the table. Oh, she tried to break that one too and stormed out. My in-laws both apologized and offered to pay for the replacement plates, but I told them not to worry about it. Also, OP, I imagine you just lost count at this point. Despite this, we still had a nice time. When everyone left, my husband told me I was out of line and cruel, but I told him that this has been happening for months and I've told him it was bothering me multiple times. It's Wednesday. He's still being a little cold to me. And I also got a text from my sister-in-law's boyfriend asking me if I would apologize to her because I really embarrassed her. AKA, he's having to deal with her bullshit now and wants it to end. I sent him the video again and he left me on red. My husband just called me to ask if I was taunting her boyfriend because his sister called him crying that I was. <sighs> Even when exposed... Okay, we talk about this a lot. When people get exposed, of course, of course, they aren't happy about it. Of course, they act out even further because they just got exposed. Like, that's what happens when people get exposed. However, to further victimize yourself when exposed about being exposed, how can OP's husband not see what's happening here? Maybe both of them, to a certain extent, are like, look, we just want the drama to effing end. Like, just, just make it stop because we're having to deal with her now. So OP's husband is now getting phone calls and texts from his sister, who's crying wolf, his boyfriend, of 
course. I know where he's coming from because he's like, make it stop, please. Make it stop. Oh, you're just going to send me the video again? Okay, cool. It's not going to stop. But Opie's husband, I'm like, come on, man. This is one of those things where clearly your sister was in the wrong. Why would you not side with your wife? Why would you not have this boundary? And also, that's your shit she's breaking too. What are you doing? Why is this okay? This is a grown ass woman breaking plates every time she comes over because they're not her style. It's an effing plate, lady. What do you do when you go to a restaurant and they bring out a plate that's not your style? You throw that on the ground too? No, try again. Bring me another plate that is my style. What's your style, ma'am? I'm not going to tell you that. You have to guess. Keep trying. Smash, smash, smash. Maybe, maybe she was traumatized by being forced to watch that scene in Beauty and the Beast whenever the plates and stuff like sing the Be Our Guest sequence. Maybe she was traumatized by having to watch that on repeat as a child or something. So now she just has an aversion to plates. The fact that she tried to break the kid's plate too is just like, you're like, no, nope, honey, that's why we gave you that one, because it won't shatter. Nice try, though. In the comments, inquiring minds need to know, why would she break your plates? Because she doesn't like to eat off something not her style? OP, I would like to know, too. We'll probably never get a straight answer, though. My husband apologized, and now we're bouncing back and forth off of the whys, and we're kind of circling around the boyfriend. In-laws say that's when they noticed a change in behavior. She's gotten into trouble since dating him. They act like teenagers. Husband is saying exactly what I was thinking was happening. He's trying not to blame or pin anything on her because he has been behaving differently over the past few months. She got caught shoplifting and boyfriend also got caught stealing and went to jail. No diagnosis that I've ever known of, but family is now saying there could be a deeper issue or possibility of a substance issue. I think it became a game to sister where she was like, I'm going to see how long I can get away with this. And also, yeah, if they're acting out like that and they're getting in that kind of trouble, either it's like an adrenaline rush thing or this is a jealousy of where they're at in life kind of thing. And they have to break the nice things that they have. The plate just happened to be the thing that she had the easiest access to. But I think once she did it a couple of times, it became a game of how many times can I do this and get away with it? What can I get away with? And apparently that's the theme in their relationship as well. But getting exposed here is fantastic. The part that I still, I'm just like, I don't understand is when she got exposed, when she had evidence put in her face, like, yeah, clearly you did this on purpose. This was premeditated. You looked around the corner to make sure nobody was watching and then you did it. And then she still victimized herself. I'm like, it's okay. I'm going to tell my kids this story and be like, this is why we use paper plates, kid. This is why we do this. It's not just because we don't want to do the dishes. It's because deep down, we just don't trust you. I'm just kidding. I wouldn't say that. I think this is one of those things where people have the short-sighted mindset and they're like morphine, not long-term solution, not let's treat the root issue here, but I just need morphine to keep the short-term drama, just make it go away. You know what? I think they did it the smart way because they collected evidence. I think that OP handled it extraordinarily well. I think gathering evidence and playing the long game here was the smart play. If she would have created some boundaries earlier, I feel like the backlash from the rest of the family would have been stronger. And I feel like she had to have this video so she had to notice the pattern first. She had to catch on to what was going on. Then she had to set something up where she could collect the evidence and then present the evidence. And that took about the amount of time that it did. She could have caught on sooner. And that would have been nice because I think all of us reading this were like after the second time, it'd be like, OK, OK, you've done this two times now. We're going to put you in the high chair. Hey there, it's Dusty Thunder again with another Reddit story for you. This one is actually titled The Best of Redditor Updates. OP specifically tells her fiance that she hates the cake smashing trend due to past trauma. He responds by doing it at their wedding. That sounds dangerous, um. Am I the astronaut for leaving my own wedding because my husband embarrassed me? I, female 27, and my husband, male 29, have been together for three years. In those three years, I have never have known him to be selfish, occasionally immature, yes, but even that was rare. These problems arose when those stupid cake-smashing videos got popular, and my husband thought they were hilarious. I've never thought they were funny, and he knows that, yet he always is showing me the videos of those poor wives getting the happiest day of their life ruined by their ass whole partner for some cheap laughs. He always knows I have a history with cake smashing. My family does the cake smashing thing. I remember it was my 17th birthday and I pleaded with my mom to not do it. She promised and I trusted her. I had my hair and makeup done up all nice and right as I blew out my candles, my mom pushed my head into the cake and one of the decorations on the cake ended up slicing my forehead. 
Not enough to go to the hospital, but enough for some substantial bleeding. And you bled all over the cake, too. My birthday was ruined, and after I wouldn't come out of my room. My mom still calls me a brat for that. Okay, cool. Not like, hey, I'm sorry. And also, I promise not to do it, but... What a selfish brat you are. You bled all over the cake. How dare you? I told him if he ever did something like that to me, I'd leave him. He started laughing, but I was being for real, though he was really not taking me seriously. Now skip to a few days ago when my wedding happened. Everything was perfect. I was happy. He was happy. I was excited for our new lives as newlyweds. I felt like a princess in my poofy white dress and done up hair with perfect makeup. All very expensive things I would like to mention. We get to our cake cutting part, and as soon as I turn to him, he scoops up a huge chunk of our wedding cake and smashes it all over my face. I mean, we knew this was coming. Coming, but bro, why? Everything just seemed to go in slow motion for a few moments. He's just laughing at me and then says, you should see your face and continues to laugh. Other people in the crowd, mostly my family, are also laughing at me. Then I just start walking away. He realizes that I'm leaving and tries to catch up with me and says that I'm being extra. That's the smart thing to say. You're being extra to your bride on your wedding day as you did something that you promised you wouldn't do that you know she has past trauma with. Smart. I push him away and order an Uber. As I got outside, most of the crowd is following me telling me to come back. I get into the Uber and drive away. I drove to our apartment and packed most of my things and went to stay at a hotel. I currently, though, am staying at a friend's house. My family and his family have been blowing up my phone for days, saying I'm being childish and my husband is a good man and it was just a joke. My husband is calling me off the hook, telling me to please come home and that he wants to talk, that he's sorry and, and didn't think that I'd get that emotional. This was supposed to be the happiest day of our lives and he embarrassed me in front of everyone for some prank that he knew I hated. Not only that, he ruined a $500 cake. He ruined my makeup, my hair, and the top of my dress. The cake got all over. Though I still do love him and I'm wondering if I really was too hard on him, that seems to be everyone else's opinion. So, am I the astronaut? Knowing what he knew, why would he choose to go ahead and do this? Like, either somebody in the family talked to him and was like, hey, you should do this because it'd be funny. It was funny way back when, when it happened. And yeah, she's going to be so pissed, but it'll be funny. Why would you want to piss off your bride on your wedding day? It's just not a smart move. You know, I just, I just said my vows and devoted the rest of my life to you to have and to hold and to protect you. But I'm immediately going to break just all of those right now. Five minutes later. Update. August 29th, 2023. One day later. And yeah, this one's pretty fresh. So my last post got taken down and I've gotten a lot of messages. I just wanted to update you all about a few things. I haven't gotten my stuff from my ex yet. I just haven't had the energy to because I'm still extremely upset, obviously. From the videos online to the comments I received on my original post to also the comments I looked at on the repost of my post, it kind of made me think that there probably was a lot of red flags and I was just used to being abused, so the bare minimum was good enough for me. After speaking about it with my friend, she said that he definitely had a lot of red flags and she even told me I should stay far away from dating until I get some help because I was obviously not seeing the red flags right in front of me. I'm not going to get into it, but sometimes I'd have to cook second dinners for my ex because he didn't like everything I made. His mom apparently didn't get him used to vegetables so he wouldn't eat them or making fun of my cramps on my period. That's some of what I was referring to when I said immature. Someone texted me saying if I was sure that he cheated on me. No, I am not sure. At the moment, it just felt like it made sense because of how horrible he was being, though they made a good point. The sister very much could have just been trying to kick me when I was down since I was leaving anyway. I have no evidence and I probably will never have evidence. Apparently, sister said that he was cheating on her. I unblocked him just to tell him that I was coming over in a few days to get my stuff and if he could just not be there and that I'd leave my keys. He said fine and that was it. So he will not be there when I get the rest of my belongings. I will also bring a friend with me in case he does something. Dude, he's gonna be there. He's going to be there hiding behind the door with the cake. You know he is. I'm still not speaking to my family, and I think I'm just going to go no contact like people suggested. I saw a video from a woman speaking about me, and someone in the comments said I was groomed into this treatment, which is why he felt it was okay to do this. Maybe she's right. When I get my finances in order, I think I'll try therapy and wait a few years before attempting to date anyone. I also keep getting this question. How did the Uber come so quick? The wedding venue was in a city, in a building. Uber took 30 seconds to order and 3 minutes to get there. There. Plus, who was really going to stop me from getting into the car? My husband gave up, to be honest, pretty fast once he saw me trying to get into the car. I thought it was weird, but I realize now, playing victim because he didn't get his way. Of course, and he had all of these supporters right behind him, right? Some of you may be saying, how did you not realize you were being abused? I don't know. Sometimes it just happens that way. 
My brain is kind of dead at this point. Again, thank you to literally everyone for all of the sweet comments and even people messaging me privately. I haven't responded to them all, but I will try to since you took time out of your day to see if I was okay. I really appreciate that. To people who say this is fake, I don't care. I went on this app because I figured I'd get like a few comments and maybe some insight. I got that insight way more than I thought I'd get in a million years, and now I'm going to move forward with my life. So this is the last update. I'm going to respond to the PMs and then forget about this account and hopefully my old life. It's genuinely too depressing for me to think about. Edit. I'm okay, though. I feel lonely and depressed, but I have my friends supporting me, so I'm not that alone. I'll be okay, and I'll get myself out of this hole. I realize this post is a bit too doom and gloom. Okay, so title again was Opie specifically tells her fiance that she hates the cake smashing trend due to past trauma. He responds by doing it at their wedding. We can go ahead and take him straight to ask on one apparently there was a lot more going on in the relationship that she had just ignored or thought that she deserved or thought that was the benchmark and thought it was okay thought it was status quo for her she doesn't have a good benchmark of what a healthy relationship should be because of how she was brought up and apparently the kind of shit that her family put her through so wow another brozo ask on one here and she even explained all of this that's the part that really pisses me off she explained it all and she's like i hate this he knew about the trauma that she went through as a kid he knew why she hated this so much and he knew because he was specifically warned not to do this at the wedding and then just did it anyway to what prove that he's the man and he's in control and she can't do shit about it well you were wrong because she did and to go through all of this to go through the ceremony and say the vows and pretend like you're going to respect someone and then immediately in the reception do the one thing that you know will tear all that down and think you're just going to get away with it and not have any kind of consequences is a straight up narcissistic brozo as con one thing to do enjoy all of that loneliness sir and then to not even give a shit to not try to make it up to her and then when she said that she's coming over to get her shit and he's like fine cool proven it all proven everything because she had this comfort in the trauma that she had before it's what she knew right it's the devil you know right so she thought that that was okay she thought doesn't everybody go through this and how unfortunate that is to not realize that there is a life out there for you free from that but yes breaking the cycle of anything is a damn near impossible thing to do there's a gravity to it that keep people held down i'm so glad that op at least said enough and walked away is going no contact with the family awesome pain creates change right so this immense pain is what it took for her finally to be like wow every Everybody in my life sucks ass. Got in the Uber and, and left. Probably showed up in a, in a coffee shop after that like Rachel. Still wearing the wedding dress, but covered in cake, crying. That would suck. But at least it, it may have taken this extraordinarily shitty thing for her to finally remove herself from that situation, but it was enough pain to create change. So hopefully she'll never end up back in that vacuum again. Hey there, it's Dusty Thunder again with another Reddit story for you. This one is from Pro Revenge, and it is titled, Cheat on Me with My Best Friend. I'll wreck your career and publicly humiliate both of you. Oh yeah, Pro Revenge. We love these. Shithead and Sarah have been like family to my wife and I for several years, practically ever since we moved in across the street from them. The four of us were extremely tight. Our kids are the same age as theirs, and we're all good friends. We're one big family unit. We did dinner together a few times a week. We went on vacations together. I truly saw Shithead as a brother, and my wife and Sarah were very close too. I love that OP has chosen the name Shithead as the character name here. Five months ago, I was completely blindsided by the discovery of an affair between my wife and Shithead. My wife had left her email open on her computer, and I saw an email from her to her longtime therapist saying that Shithead would be joining her at an upcoming session again uh wtf my mind started racing why in the world would shithead be going to her therapy sessions without my knowledge i did a search and found some other emails to and from the therapist proving that shithead had been going to sessions together with her for about six weeks Pew. I checked our mobile phone account and discovered that since late summer, they had been exchanging hundreds of texts every day, peaking at nearly 500 per day by the holidays. How is that even possible? 
Speaking of the holidays, my wife and I hosted both of our families, parents, siblings, etc. for both Thanksgiving and Christmas dinner, and Shithead and Sarah joined us either for dinner or after dinner on both holidays. Text records showed that the entire time that they were at our house celebrating with our families, my wife and Shithead were texting each other across the room. They were doing that pretty much every time the four of us hung out for months, and you know, all day, every day, just in general. But what bothers me the most is that they were doing it with Sarah and I right there. I confronted my wife with the evidence and she admitted that yes, she and Shithead had fallen in love. It just happened. I don't know how, but I love him and I just don't feel anything for you anymore. I'm sorry. They had gone on a school district trip together. Something had happened in her hotel room and things had moved quickly from there. She explained as I lay face down on the couch, unable to look at her, that they had already made plans to move out and divorce me and Sarah. And while they didn't plan to move in together immediately because of the kids, they'd probably do so eventually. The meetings with the therapist were supposedly most for the purpose of finding a way to break this to me and Sarah as gently as possible because they were so very concerned for our well-being. Sarah and I are fairly certain that they weren't planning on telling us about the affair at all. They were simply going to discover their feelings for one another several months down the line after they'd come up with some other reason to divorce the two of us. My wife moved out two months ago. I was and still am utterly destroyed. I cry every day. I cried writing the first few paragraphs of this story just now. I worry nonstop about the impact on our kids, but I'm also not exactly a shrinking violet when I feel that I've been wronged. And in this case, I was objectively very, very wronged. So, a couple of years ago, Shithead ran for a Board of Education seat as a pretty extreme underdog. Well, yeah, I mean, yard signs that say Shithead don't exactly beg for a vote. I helped him with his campaign materials and debate prep, and my wife, a well-known school district employee, this becomes important later, got the word out as best she could. Much to our surprise, he actually won in a squeaker by just a few dozen votes. Shithead wins in squeaker. Headline. Being on the board became the center of Shithead's world. He joined every committee that he could. This turned into the foundation of his affair with my wife as they were constantly going to school events and meetings together on evenings and weekends. Once I discovered the affair, my thoughts turned pretty quickly to revenge, and it occurred to me that an extramarital affair between a member of the Board of Education and an employee of the school district was at least bad politics and possibly violated district policy. Making things far worse for them was that my wife was in the running for an open administrative position, and everyone knew that she was more or less guaranteed the job. And the major pay raise that came with it. She had just finished her master's degree in school administration at the urging of her principal and the superintendent so that she could be promoted to this specific position. I had plenty of evidence of the affair. Text from both of them admitting to it, text records showing that they were texting hundreds of times a day, emails to and from the therapist, etc. I considered simply emailing all of the evidence to the board and the superintendent, but felt like I, as the grieving betrayed spouse, might not be seen as a credible source. So instead, I invented a fictitious, furious friend who was planning on showing up to the next board meeting and publicly shaming the two of them for their affair. I told my wife that I had tried to talk this person down, but couldn't guarantee that they wouldn't show up and humiliate them publicly, as I expected this led shithead to conclude that the only option was for him to preemptively admit the affair to the board. The superintendent subsequently recommended that Shithead resign, which he did. Sarah said that he was utterly humiliated and crushed and barely got out of bed for a few days afterwards. Once word of the affair and Shithead's resignation started getting around, the superintendent, a longtime friend of both my wife and Shithead, contacted my wife and tearfully informed her that it was no longer politically appropriate for her to be promoted to an administrative position within the district. The position that had been lined up for her was later filled by an outside candidate. This sent waves of confusion and rumor throughout the district, as it was pretty well known that my wife was getting the job. The day after she was informed that she wasn't getting the promotion, my wife and I, despite our crumbling marriage, took our son out to breakfast together on his birthday, and a parent stopped by our table to congratulate her on her new role. She said thanks, then excused herself to go cry in the bathroom for a while. I let the dust settle for a couple of weeks, and then right before my wife moved out, let them in on my little secret. There was never a furious friend threatening to expose them in the first place, just me. Why would you do that? Man, why would you give that up? Why? You had everything. You had everything. You had ev Why? Why out yourself here? 
Word of all of this had gotten around our fairly small town, which Shithead grew up in and my wife has worked in for nearly 20 years. My wife refuses to talk to me about how things are at work now, but I've heard from some other people I know in the district that her formerly spotless reputation has taken a major hit. Shithead, formerly a gregarious social presence in our neighborhood at the events and pubs in town, has completely gone underground and barely emerges to mow his lawn. He's moving out soon to a shitty little townhouse, which is all he can afford due to all the child support he's going to have to pay his wife. My wife and Shithead claim that they plan on trying to make things work together despite all the public humiliation. I wish them lots of luck with that. I'm sure it will be a lot of fun to show their faces together in town. Edit, here's a log of their texts and calls over the course of a few months before I discovered the affair. Obviously, their phone numbers have been stripped out. Wowza, okay, we got some answers to common questions in the comments here. Question, are you and Sarah a thing now? You should totally be a thing. That would be awesome. Answer. No, we're friends. We've been incredibly important to each other since this all started and have certainly gotten a lot closer, but not in the way everyone's thinking. This would all be so much harder to deal with if I didn't have her to lean on. And she says she feels the same way about me. We're going through basically the exact same situation with the same players after all. Shithead hasn't moved out yet. Once he does, we plan to go back to getting the kids together more often like we used to. It'll never be the same, of course. She already does come over with the kids from time to time, but it's just tough with Shithead's constant presence across the street. Question. Didn't your revenge hurt both sets of kids? Answer. Not really. Shithead has a day job. The Board of Education was his hobby and his passion, but this didn't affect his income at all. And my wife has been assured that if she wants to pursue an administrative position with another district, she'll have glowing letters of recommendation from her superintendent and principal. It'll mean giving up a lot of work relationships in the process, but given the hit her reputation has taken, I'm guessing she makes that jump sooner rather than later. In the meantime, not moving to an administrative job means that she still has summers off with the kids. Question. Why didn't you notice all of the texting your wife was doing? Answer. Well, I did. It was really starting to piss me off. It was excessive. She has a big social circle and does tend to text a lot anyway, but it was really getting over the top to the point that she was completely ignoring me and the kids. At one point in November, I asked her to agree to a no phones at the dinner table rule, which she agreed to reluctantly, but then would pout throughout dinner. And eventually she just started using her phone during dinner again. All that said, I was blind. Not only was the texting getting weird, but her relationship with shithead was starting to make me uncomfortable. Sarah noticed it too and agreed. We confronted them a couple of times about it directly, and they both swore up and down that it was just school stuff that they were talking about. There was nothing else going on. And for whatever reason, we believed them, probably because the mind tends to refuse to see things it doesn't want to see. Note from OP, thanks, by the way, for all of the support and the comments. I couldn't reply to everyone, but I did read them all, and I appreciate them, even the brutally honest feedback from people who feel that I did the wrong thing. Posting this and reading all of the responses introduced me to perspectives I hadn't considered about all of this and reminded me most of all of the anguish I'm dealing with is pretty normal given the situation that I'm going through. I had a pretty okay Memorial Day weekend even though I missed my wife and thought a lot about the things we'd probably be doing as a family. I'm taking my kids camping next weekend and having something like that to look forward to and plan has me feeling pretty good today. Okay, there is an update, but let's discuss for a moment. I think when they made the decision to cheat, when they made the decision to be deceitful, it became a come what may. They, at that point, made the decision to to risk everything. And they did. They risked everything here. They deserved what they got. We'll put it that way. I don't think that there was an incentive for OP to claim the ruse. I think leaving that on the down low was probably the right way to go. I just don't know that there was any benefit to it unless he wanted the personal satisfaction of them knowing that it was him who did it. That's the only benefit in anything there. Look at it this way. The school board finding out would have happened eventually. And if there was no issue with the two of them being involved, then nothing would have happened. But it was an issue. It was wrong. And because of that, corrective actions were taken. Or careers suddenly had ceilings to them. And he certainly abused his position, Shithead. Shithead abused his position on the school board here, abused his relationship with his neighbors too, took advantage of his friend in OP. Like, they got what they deserved here. I am an advocate for kids having two homes with happy parents rather than one home with unhappy parents. And I think, you know, for someone who, who goes through for the first time, you know, a, a relationship falling apart or a marriage falling apart and there are kids involved, it's it's tough to see that. Kids will hold together a relationship much longer than it should. But I think once you go through it once, 
and see the aftermath or see the result of it, then you can see that, yeah, your kids are going to be happy when you're happy. And sometimes that involves being in two separate homes. This was going to come out at some point anyway, and then it would be a, oh, how long has this been going on? And either they would lie about it then or they'd tell the truth and then it would be just as big of a deal as it is. Update, December 4th, 2022. Where to start? It's been a bizarre few years, especially with COVID thrown in the mix, which I somehow still have never caught despite my kids getting it twice, thankfully just mild cases. Well, at the time that I posted the original story, I was obviously a wreck. Things actually got significantly darker for a while after that. My ex decided to start bringing shithead around our kids just a few months after she moved out, which was really hard for me to deal with. I reluctantly decided to dip my toe into the online dating world, and after a number of short-term things that didn't pan out, I actually connected with someone. We'll have been together for two years next month. She's absolutely amazing. We don't live together, and for the time being, we're both good with seeing each other a few times a week. Would I love to see her more? Yep. Am I ready to live with someone again and go all Brady Bunch with our respective kids? I'm not sure. But for the time being, we have a lot of fun together, and that's more than good enough for me. As far as things stand with my ex and shithead, they're still together. But there seems to be trouble in paradise because my kids report that they almost never see him anymore. My kids don't like him at all, and they just avoid him when he's around, according to my older one. When all of this started, she had seemed confident confident that they'd be living together pretty soon, but they still don't, and as far as I know, there are no plans in the works for that. They did buy a boat together, which I find hilarious for some reason. It just seems like the classic affair couple thing to do. Sarah took a long time to accept that her marriage was truly over, but once she did, she did a really admirable job of moving on. She engrossed herself in home improvement projects. She remains the same incredible mom that she's always been. And she's been in an FWB type relationship, which is all she wants right now, with a nice, funny guy for almost two years. We hang out here and there, especially when my pool is open in the summer. We aren't nearly as dependent on each other as we were in the beginning, but we're still close friends. And no, still nothing more than that. Which I'm glad about because the one thing this situation definitely never needed was more drama. My ex left the school district she was working for and took a job in a neighboring district. I have no idea what shithead is up to, nor do I care. I hardly ever see him except at the occasional school event. For a while there, I was worried that he'd look at me the wrong way and I'd wind up in jail for knocking him out in an elementary school cafeteria or something, but I just didn't care enough about him anymore for that to be a concern. So all in all, life is pretty okay right now. I do miss being a family. I still have nightmares about all of this stuff and deal with intrusive thoughts at times. I fall asleep to audiobooks now to keep my thoughts at bay. Otherwise, still struggle to sleep sometimes, but my girlfriend is amazing. I have an incredibly supportive family. I just officiated my sister's wedding a couple of months ago, and I have a big dog who needs lots of walks, and that's a huge help for me on so many levels. I hope that update answered people's questions. Thanks again for all of the support. Wow. Okay. So... I think the having to deal with shithead afterward, like, yeah, I mean, that's that's something you have to think about and you can't choose your ex's partner. Right. So as uncomfortable as he may be with uh, with them being around his kids, like you can't you can't stop that. I'm hoping in this whole situation that OP wasn't bad mouthing shithead to the kids, which laid the foundation for them not liking him. Hopefully that was a conclusion that they came to of their own accord. Hopefully that was a decision they made on their own because when parents start using kids and trying to influence kids to have opinions of people like that, when it's partners of their exes, that's dirty pool. Definitely don't want to go that route. I hope he didn't go that route, um, but it's, it sounds like they didn't. I mean, if it was as public knowledge as it was, then maybe the kids knew the whole story anyway and drew their own conclusions from that. And I get that. As long as he wasn't like, hey, you know that guy? His name's Shithead. You guys should call him Shithead. You should not like him. He's a dick. As long as he wasn't doing that kind of stuff. Okay. I am glad that he was able to move on. I'm glad he was able to find somebody and to get over this. That's a scar he's going to carry with him for a long time. And I mean, it's a deep, deep, deep betrayal from two sides. If your spouse had cheated on you or betrayed you with someone that you didn't know, that's one thing. It being someone you do know is a whole nother thing that just, I think, widens the wound or presents two different wounds and now you don't have just a relationship trauma to overcome here to heal from now you have a friendship one and now that has to change the way that you look at or value friendships and the way that you look at and value relationships it would be garbage it was a terrible thing to do and and op and sarah thinking that they never planned on telling them or breaking it to them they planned on 
a ruse that just revealed the feelings much, much later on. That's entirely possible. To be able to take advantage of this friend who had helped run your political campaign and get you to where you are, they're, they're both smart enough to say, hey, this is wrong. We need to stop this. Even if it's just like sparks flying in that first encounter, whatever the hell it was, they were both smart enough to put a stop to it. They were both smart enough to know what they were risking moving forward with it, and they chose to move forward. So there it is. It's a rough, rough scenario. Not having enough respect for the person that you love or the person that you're with to just be upfront about it is a different deal. I mean, obviously that points to other problems in the relationship. Sure, maybe they spent enough time together in innocent ways to just develop a stronger connection, but it's normally a larger indicator that there's something wrong with their relationships that they're already in. So OP here, if this didn't happen with shithead, there was obviously something wrong enough for there to be fertile ground for it. So there were problems problems already that you just weren't aware of. I don't know if we got into their kids' ages either. It seems like we didn't spend a ton of time there on the kids, but it's tough on kids. But if they end up with two happy environments, cool. Hey there, it's Dusty Thunder again with another Reddit story for you. This is a petty revenge story, which I'm really happy about. And it is titled, I put a fake note on a Corvette's windshield that read, Sorry I hit your car. You probably won't even notice the damage because it was taking up four spots. So, title is fairly self-explanatory, but I'll elaborate. I was trying to find a parking spot at my university. The lot was notoriously crowded, but my campus didn't have a lot of options. While searching, I saw a Corvette taking up four prime spots near the front of the lot. After about 10 minutes of waiting and looking for a spot, one opened up towards the back of the lot. Furious at the nerve of the driver being so inconsiderate, I wrote a note saying, Sorry I hit your car. You probably won't even notice the damage and left it on the windshield. When I got out of class and was headed back to my car, I saw a very stereotypical college-aged Corvette owner frantically searching their vehicle while yelling into their phone. I don't know who they were talking to, but I feel bad for them having to deal with this person. <laughs> this is fantastic. That's it. That's the end of the story. It's a, it's a short one. Love the petty revenge ones, and this would have been a perfect opportunity for a DFHB sticker, right? This is exactly the kind of shit we're talking about with DFHB, which is the Decent Effing Human Beings Club. It is just being a decent person to the rest of humanity and not parking like an entitled idiot and not leaving shit out for other people to have to deal with, not being inconsiderate of people. That's the kind of shit that we're talking about here. And this is a great example of someone who would get rejected from the DFHB club. Owning a Corvette does not entitle you to four parking spaces and it does not make you less likely to get a ding. If anything, it, it makes you a bigger target. How is it possible to park in four spaces? Oh, I think I get it. So if it wasn't an edge, but if it was where there are two parking spots connected here, so one, two, and then the line that separates them, if they parked smack dab in the middle, like four square, if they parked in the middle of the four square, then they took up four spots. Wow. Not just two spots, not just two, four. Like, wow, buddy. If it's on university grounds, there's probably still some kind of rule disallowing that from happening. I'd call campus police and be like, hey, this Corvette needs towed because it's clearly in violation. It looks like it's been abandoned, honestly. It's, I've seen it here for seven days. She's been right there in the middle of the parking lot, probably broke down. Or someone tried to drift it. Probably would have gotten a ticket for that. I would hope so. Hey there, it's Dusty Thunder again with another Reddit story for you. We have another petty revenge, which makes everyone happy. This one is titled, Faked Proof That I Had a Flat Tire So That The Lazy People On My Group Project Would Have To Do The Presentation Themselves, Therefore Likely Will Fail. There's some premeditation involved with this one. I'm in a class where a group research project slash presentation is a huge chunk of overall points. Everyone knows in group projects, you always have that one slacker who doesn't do anything that you have to compensate for. However, I got stuck 
stuck with possibly the worst three people to be in a project with in the class. I did the entire research, presentation, poster boards, etc., among many other things myself. I tried talking to them and telling them they needed to put in their share of the effort. Ignored. I'd send them tasks to do. Ignored. I'd try to schedule meetings. They'd say they were coming and then leave me alone at the library. This happened from the get-go. It was abundantly clear that they expected everyone else to do the work, but everyone else just turned out to be me. Rule. We couldn't have things 100% memorized word for word, and we couldn't read off of anything. We had to actually know the subject. I was fully prepared to do most of the talking and even wrote down a small script for them and told them to know what to say during their part at the very least. The night before, I told them we had to meet to at least go over the whole thing one time. Again, none of them showed. At this point, I'm livid and decide they can just do it themselves, which means they'd get up there, not know a damn thing to say other than the small info that I gave them and couldn't even bullshit anything because they did no research. Thing is, if we miss without an excuse, we fail the project. If you have an excuse, you have to have documentation. I commute and live an hour away, so I decide that I'll conveniently have a flat tire right before class. Went out and actually bought a tire so I could have the receipt to prove it. Emailed the professor who said I can present by myself during his office hours. Turns out they completely bombed and not only probably failed the project, but since they're bad students, might even make them fail the class. Edited to say the professor stated at the beginning that we were not allowed to contact him about people slacking in the group and said to work it out amongst ourselves. Said that we were adults and that he wouldn't even respond to emails about it. Well, that's kind of shitty on the professor's part, isn't it? Because then if you're this kind of person, the one person who's going to do the work, who's there to enforce? OP can't enforce anything. It's the professor's job to do that. The only other option is to do what OP did here. I think that is a, uh, I think it's a shit coward move by the professor. Yeah, you're the administrator here, dude, prof. You will actually have to do something and deal with people like that. We've read similar stories where the professor actually was in the know on things and it helped the whole situation. So saying just figure it out when no one has any authority to fix anything is a lazy, cowardly move. And yeah, I get you're going to have to figure out how to deal with these kinds of people in life all the time. But someone has to have some actual power to enforce things. And the professor is the only one in this scenario who has that. And he took himself out of play. So what the hell, man? I think given that they didn't have any other choice but this. Yeah. Also, buying a tire. Actually buying the tire, worth it. 100% worth it. You're going to need it at some point anyway. Now you got a full size spare. It's fine. It's fine. And OP gets to still maintain their grade because they're going to present during office hours. I would, during office hours, go ahead and fill him in on everything. He said he didn't want to hear about it, but he needs to hear about it. And obviously, he probably knows now because the rest of the group just bombed on everything. But dear God, man, this is part of a professor's job, I feel like. I think it's a necessary evil because in many works, scenarios, you are going to have to work in groups and on teams. However, there was always going to be an admin. There's going to be someone who is in charge and can enforce and keep people accountable there. I think that there is value in having to do it, but there has to be some kind of hierarchy involved for group projects, for team projects to be able to work. We have a team here for the Dusty Thunder stuff, but we also have a team for Storm Cloud Marketing for our agency. And there are sub teams there. Like we have our creative team. We have a digital team. We have the video team. We have different subsets there and someone always has to be able to say we need to do this. Someone has to have the authority to create change. Someone has to have the authority to create accountability. And if they didn't allow the group to like vote on who that person was and create some kind of reporting structure to keep people accountable, then it's worthless. If they're just saying y'all deal with it and make each other accountable and I don't want to know nothing about it, that's not helpful. That's not constructive at all. There has to be some way to keep people accountable because left to their own device many people are not accountable. As long as there's some kind of structure to it to facilitate the whole group actually working and there's some kind of monitored process in there, great. Because yes, having to work on a team is likely to happen as you enter the business world. No matter what you do, you're going to likely encounter some kind of team that you have to function on. So knowing how to do that, knowing how to work with different personalities is a big deal. However, knowing that you're not just a victim in all of it when people don't pull their weight is a big deal too.